uh, to semantics to to semantics to and what i'm working on right now which is i assume the final thing because academics don't retire is holistic specifications with with sophia i was head of department for six years and i was on appointments and promotion panels for 20 years so i think that in a way that's probably more interesting for questions than my my research career Great, thanks a lot, Susan. Uh, next up is Sam. Hi, I'm uh, Sam Lindley. Um, I'm currently at Harriet Watt University, an associate professor there, but I will be moving back to Edinburgh University, which is in the same town, in February, uh, which is where I spent much of my research career. I've had rather a unusual research career, I guess. I spent quite a long time as a, as a postdoctoral researcher um, and in fact yeah I only, only got my first faculty position uh, in the middle of a pandemic uh, which I've just left to take up another faculty position um, but yeah I guess I, I've had about what 13 14 years of, of postdoctoral research mixed in with a bit of time in industry as well uh, and I've worked on various things in PL. Um, most recently, I've been focusing on session type systems and um, effects, which is really my main area of research now. And I'm just about to start a, a research fellowship um, on effect handler oriented programming. Uh, so I'm actually looking for PhD students and I'll be hiring a postdoc in a year's time as well. Okay, Thanks. Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Sam. Uh, next up is Ji-Hoon. Hi, my name is Ji-Hoon, and I'm an assistant professor in KAIST, uh, which is located in Daejeon, Daejeon, Korea. And I'm working on generally topics on concurrency, parallelism, or compiler, or program verification, etc. And I started my graduate study in 2013, and after six years, I I moved to KAIST and I think you will be interested in the earlier career as a faculty in university. And for research wise, you may be interested in concurrency and parallelism and compilers. Thank you. Thank you, Jihoon. Uh, next up is Delphine. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is uh, Delphine Demange. I'm um, um, and um, maître de conférence in French, uh, which is associate professor, I guess. Uh, that's the English word for it. Uh, I'm working at the University of Rennes, which is located in France, Brittany. And I'm uh, working on uh, compiler verification, uh, programming language semantics, and uh, basically all the, the language-based uh, techniques that you can find to uh, to assist the, the verification of uh, systems or, uh, or uh, languages implementation. All right, thanks, Delphine. And our last uh, but not least uh, panelist is Favonia. Um, hi, uh, I'm Favonia, I use they, them. And uh, I just joined the University of Minnesota as an assistant professor, I think 1.5 uh, years ago. And um, so, I, Research-wise, um, I'm doing. Uh, I've been sp spending lots of time in homotopy type theory and cubical type theory. I'm also doing research in programming, uh, program testing using types. Yeah, so let me stop here. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks, Savonia. Um, to kind of get things uh, started, and again, feel free to raise raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, so the first uh, question I was thinking about asking the panelists is. Uh, about about your kind of most recent research project and how did it get started? Uh, I find that research projects kind of start in many different ways. Uh, I was wondering if you could you know talk about how you know your most recent project started. If it's not your most recent one, it's it's probably still fine because we won't know. Uh, Greg, um, my the most recent project is something that I got started with Nate Foster, who's been working on uh, network switches and programming languages for those for a while and. Uh, he started telling me about how 
this language P4. And if you look at it, it's a beautiful little language, a lot of fun to mess around with, but it has these built-in parsers that are horrible. <laughs> they're, 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 they're just manual state machines. Um, and uh, they're not very compositional. There's a lot, there, it's, it's sort of the worst part of the language. So uh, with my postdoc, uh, John, um, I've, I've been starting to mess around with that. So anyway, it got started because I like to hang out with smart people like Nate and hear what they have to say, what they're working on, and uh, try to try to inject some PL uh, goodness wherever wherever you find systems badness. That's sort of a that's sort of a general theme for me. Okay, uh, cool, interesting. Uh, Susan, uh, would you like to answer? Okay, okay, so. I had determined that I was not going to continue working on research after I retired, but I really like Sophia's I, I, ideas that we have to be able to have defensive specifications that can work in an open world and that we weren't that our current methods for doing specification were for very small were for small uh, closed world programs. And I think I just got captured. You know, um, it, it, it just was something that I thought, oh, I, I'm, I'd like to figure out how, how, how to help so that this actually were, works. Um, but I think that's the great advantage of research is that you can work on something that captures you. Cool, uh, I agree. Uh, Sam, uh, what do you think? Um. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll talk about my, my research project that is formally starting in two weeks time. This is this, this fellowship I mentioned. Uh, although actually I've been working in this area for, oof, I don't know, eight, nine years now. Um, and I guess that, that, that kind of started off, as I said, I was, I've been a, spent a long time as a postdoc. So I, I work on, the, or formally work on whatever project I'm I'm employed to work on, but I've been fortunate enough to work with people who let me sort of do my own research on the side. And this was sort of started as a, as a side project. So this is um, on, on effect handlers coming out of the theory of algebraic effects. And I kind of started off by just kind of hacking on some, some libraries to do this and then got very interested in, in the theory and, and it all developed into uh, a whole range of different, different projects. Um, I guess um, a lot of the, the, the actual heavy lifting got done by um, students I, I brought in. Uh, and then having uh, built this, this sort of research program, I was in a really good position to apply for um, much more funding, which is what I've, I've finally got. I, my first attempt actually at submitting this, this thing uh, didn't quite make it. I got through to the final interview stage and then they only funded one out of three of these things. But I, I took, got really good advice from, from various people and was able to revise it. And the second time round, it got accepted. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I highly recommend um, persisting and uh, listening to people's advice. Okay, That's, advice is always good. Um, uh, Jihoon? Uh, could you tell us about your you know, most recent project? So as a research agenda, I'd like to verify big software, system software. With, uh, so in, in specific, I'd like to verify operating systems in these days. The reason is that I think the PL is a fundamentally about abstractions. We are, we are trying to make good abstractions out of software and other kinds of things. And operating systems is almost always the most interesting systems I have experienced, so that's the reason why I'd like to verify operating systems with respect to their abstraction or some specifications. And in this umbrella of our verification, there are many things. For example, in some part of the operating systems, there are very complex systems, complex, uh, complex components inside operating systems, for example, garbage collectors. So, as a, so I'd like to develop a new new garbage collector algorithm that is more easily verifiable. And, and I am recently verifying this garbage collector with separation logic 
in more specifically Iris. Or in other aspects of this project, there is a problem of scalability. Operating system is enlist uh, 10,000 lines of code. And usually the realistic operating systems are having more than million lines of code. And it is really impossible to verify this manually. And we need to find some, some automated way for verifying this fixed up here. And in, in order to do so, I'd like to leverage uh, what is called an affine type system or Rust type system and using the Rust, Rust type checker results in verifying this software. So, so there are many, many aspects of research inside this big umbrella of the project and it is uh, the most things I'm working on in these days. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Ji Hoon. Uh, Delphine, uh, can you tell us about your you know, latest research project and how it kind of got started perhaps? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. So the the latest uh, project I was involved in uh, is, is not a formal project. There is no grant, there is no application process. It was just a random uh, meeting. Uh, I was I was just finishing a line of work about so it was very difficult proof that was uh, that, that was uh, uh, lasting for uh, several years, actually, of work. And I was presenting this work uh, in an internal scientific meeting at INRIA. And just after the talk, I met some colleague that I, that I never uh, met before. And uh, we started to talk about uh, his uh, current project, uh, which is uh, uh, about uh, intermittent system. So these are little systems that, uh, that uh, most of the time are uh, just uh, switching off <laughs> and then starting again. And he, he, that, was, that was interesting because they were, they were uh, uh, crucially uh, feeling the need uh, for, uh, uh, for formal verification uh, in, their, in their current project because they were not, uh, uh, they were not entirely sure about uh, how the system should behave and how uh, how they should uh, uh, ensure that the system is behaving correctly, and so uh, I was I was just uh, fascinated by this uh, by this uh, application case. So we decided to start uh, and discuss. It it, it took a, a bit of time uh, to. Uh, be sure that we were on the same page uh, and uh, to find a common uh, subject. Uh, but this is how it started, and I did it. I did. Uh, I did. Uh, I was very uh, um, uh, happy and excited about how it, it started because it was very informal. So that was a that was a, a good amount of luck also. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks, Delphine. Uh, Favonia. Um, so my latest project is on program testing, and this was actually something I started long before my thesis. So I put aside a project for my thesis, and now I think, okay, I need to uh, give you some justice. Um, so it was, it, you know, it was started as my attempt to verify the library code we used during the teaching when I was a TA. Uh, so I bring it up because I think there's always a tension between the teaching and research. Uh, we only have such a limited amount of time. But sometimes if you think very hard about teaching, you can still find topics in research. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Thanks a lot, Favonia. Um, all right. So I guess kind of continuing on that theme of, you know, not having enough time sometimes to pursue all the research directions we would like. Um, uh, the second question I, I have, unless there's more in you know, audience questions, uh, second question I had is, um, you know, can you can you describe maybe one research direction that you are not working on right now that seems very exciting? Like, you know, if you had twice as much time that you would maybe think about doing another line of research, because uh, generally people are generally very excited about their own research, but I'm curious to hear, you know, what besides your own research do you, do you think is very exciting, if anything? Do we have to stick to computer science? Uh, you don't have to, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, so I mentioned that I my other project is rapid COVID testing. Uh, so I've been learning a lot about um, 
you know, biology, I guess we all have during the crisis. And um, I think it would be a lot of fun to go do a deep dive on genomics and uh, understanding what computer science could bring there. I think another area that I'm, I think is really ripe for digging into is uh, symbolic AI. You know, all, all the work on deep learning and connectionism and so forth um, is exciting, but is only going so far. And I think uh, there's gonna be a resurgence in the next 10 years around how do you take those advances and marry them back to classic things in AI like representations and symbolic reasoning and inference and all the things that are closer to the PL end of the spectrum. And you know what, you know, to some degree, the, the crossover in the other direction, the way synthesis has been enabled by ML, but I haven't seen that tied back to proof search and, and all the good work that was done in the 50s and 60s around that in the same way that uh, I think it could be. So it's, it's, it's the marriage of PL and AI, but not necessarily the way that people are looking at it today that I think is gonna be really exciting. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Susan, what do you think? Okay, so I'm not looking for anything else, but one of the things that I, I would really like somebody to look at is by far the most popular programming language in the world is Excel. And it is a disgusting language. And it, you know, and people commit horrible, you know, do horrible things and it behaves in bizarre ways. And I sort of feel the PL community could do something to do a subset of it that didn't leave one with surprises every time you used it and required huge expertise. And we just have complete contempt for it, even though it is undoubtedly the largest, you know, the most used programming language in the world. We don't even list it in lists of, of programming languages, but it's Turing complete. I don't know why it isn't a language. It's interesting, Susan. Uh, Sam, what do you think? I, I think I, <laughs> I maybe have to follow up on what Susan and what Greg said. Okay. Um, is it, I, I believe people at Microsoft are working on um, something along the lines of what, what Susan was suggesting. Am I? Am I wrong? I think so. So. Something as in Go people ahead. like Simon Page and Jones. And yeah, but what Simon is doing is he's adding functional features to VB, right? This is not where the, you know, this is not going to make your banker who uses Excel as number one language in banking write better programs. You know, it's, it's just at the edge. Mm -hmm. but, but there are people like uh, Emery Berger who've done tools for finding bugs in. Yeah, there are software engineering tools for, yep. for, for not a huge number. I mean, it's still backward compared to any modern programming language we use. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree, oh, sorry. Um, and then uh, the, the, the real answer I was gonna give was pretty much the same one that Greg gave about symbolic AI. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure it's necessarily a thing I want to work on myself, but I was particularly uh, take, uh, persuaded when I saw a talk by someone I, I can't remember the name of, but it was an AI researcher a few years ago, gave a very compelling talk where he, he gave these various examples and was showing that um, if you just do the naive thing that people tend to do nowadays, they just sort of throw arbitrary data at their, their big black box and then expect it to see patterns, uh, then you get stupid results. I mean, it's, it's hardly surprising. There's no structure there at all. You, you just sort of give it the, the raw pixels and you ask it to recognize an image. And he gave various examples that were way better. And one of them in particular was, um, it was a, a racing car driving around a track. And they, they, they showed it the, this AI program uh, well, fed it to this uh, machine learning algorithm and it, it was able to learn to drive around the track. It sort of wobbled a bit. But then he refactored the problem by designing a little DSL for um, describing um, the, the, the abstractions that were relevant to driving a car and then reran the, the, the machine learning algorithm 
and the result was that it drove around very smoothly around that track. Now he gave both results to two different, two completely different tracks, the, the things that have been learned. And um, the first one just crashed, but the one that had learned this structured symbolic representation drove perfectly around this completely different track. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it struck me then there's, there's, we really, really should be applying the techniques that we've developed in, in the PL domain um, to, to machine learning and AI. I mean, it's, it's like really low hanging fruit. I know some people are starting to do that kind of thing, but there's, there's huge potential there. More to be done, I'm sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Ji Hoon? Okay, so, so I'm in university and I think that it is really difficult to compete with companies when you are working on something that can be can make return in one or two years so i i think that in universities we need to we need to think of something that can make return or can make revenue in five or ten years or later so i'm generally interested in some this kind of big shots and the the the, the past interest i had is rust uh, which is a programming language and and the FPGAs, and in the future, but but I I've also meant to work on quantum computing, but I couldn't because I think that it can be, it can, it can change a lot of things in computing, and it 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 if it will work, then it will it will I mean, change how programs will be, uh, I mean deployed and programmed and deployed in the high performance computing community. So that is something that I am not doing now, but I'm interested in. Okay, uh, thanks, Jihoon. Uh, Delphine? Yes, uh, I, will, I will just say that uh, I, can, I can just uh, subscribe to, to everything what, what was said. Uh, um, myself, I uh, what I would like to explore if I would have like uh, 42 hours in just one day, uh, I would like to make uh, uh, all 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 my uh, uh, research results. I would like them to be more applicable in the in a general audience. So uh, um, because sometimes I uh, I think that we are doing a, a, a very uh, uh, impressive uh, uh, amount of work. Uh, but there is uh, still this uh, uh, this uh, little thing that misses uh, in order to be able to speak to uh, a larger audience and to make formal methods more applicable in the in the uh, in the uh, general programming uh, uh, area. So this is what I would like to to look at, and this is probably not uh, just. Uh, uh, Putting more theory into into uh, the thing, but uh, it can be also uh, some more uh, uh, engineering uh, problematics and uh, this kind of stuff. So this is not currently what I'm uh, working on, but this is really something I will I would like to 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 push. Okay, great. Thanks, Delphine. Uh, Favonia. Um. Well, I was about to say something about web security, but since all of you have been talking about something uh, toward application, let me toward the other extreme. So uh, one of the projects I'm interested in that I am not doing right now is uh, to use, um, to talk about the programming language in a more general way, and let me give you an example. So, so you have seen uh, the logical relations earlier in the, uh, the mentoring workshop, so technically speaking, um, whenever you are changing just even a slight bit of the language, like adding a new type or whatever, you actually, theoretically, you will have to reprove uh, the fundamental lemma of the logical relation and do everything like all at once. So whenever you are changing a language, even just a little bit, you have to reprove the relation. So there are ways, potentially there are ways to deal with this so that you don't have to redo all the work for every single new language. Uh, there should be a general way to say that, I want to talk about all the languages with functions types or all the language with natural numbers. And the best way I know of so far is using, mind you, 
category theory uh, via the universal uh, properties. Um, so that could be a one way to go because right now uh, we have the amazing logical relations for many languages, but technically speaking, we actually have to reprove them every time. So if there's a, a rigorous way to say that, I'm talking about a class of programming languages, not just one single uh, particular language, then I think that would be great. Uh, so I'm not working on that yet. <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks, Sonia. Um, okay. So the, the next question we have on our list uh, is always a, a favorite question for these research panels. Um, so uh, people are always asking, you know, how, how do you come up with new ideas or, or ideas for new directions? Uh, I think this is one of the most difficult aspects of doing research and everyone kind of approaches this in different ways. Um, but I mean, do you have any tips or things that, you know, you have tried before in the past with success or not much success uh, to find new ideas or directions? Oof. So I like to zag when everybody else is zigging. You know, if everybody's working on uh, high level languages, then I want to work on low level languages. Uh, or if everybody's working on connectionist AI, then I want to work on symbolic AI. And part of that is I'm just too stupid to actually win if I'm going head to head with uh, all the world when they're taking on something. So I always like to try to look for almost the opposite. Um, so that's one way. Another, another one is I love to read other people's papers. Uh, reviewing papers is a great way to get ideas because you're thinking critically about what people are doing. And actually, PhD theses are the best documents in the world to go off and read and get ideas from. Um, so if you get a chance, be a reviewer or be a, even better being on somebody's committee. Or uh, I, I once got to do uh, the ACM dissertation award committee. That was the best time that I ever had, best reading. You learn so much. Um, and especially when you read things that are outside your own field, because that's, you know, then you start to say, oh, how can I bring my ideas to it? Cool, thanks, Greg. Uh, Susan? Uh, uh, just following on on something Greg said. So I chaired the SIG plan PhD awards for six years. And what I found, in, one of the things I found interesting about them was that there were clearly topics that were very popular, you know, when Greg, when you said you zig when someone zags, that, you know, one year everyone did concurrency stuff and the next year we had data stuff. And it was clearly stuff that had happened four or five years earlier. I mean, my, prep, my definition of an academic is somebody who has more ideas of things than they have resources to follow. They don't have enough hours of the day. They don't. And, I think the problem isn't always finding a new topic, but deciding which topics you're not going to follow. Um, and if you don't have more ideas, then probably being an academic isn't the right, 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 right job for you. Uh, because I think it's what glues everything together is that you're following, you're someone who wants to follow your own, own um, research agenda but, yeah but things are and i think you have to you have to find the ideas if it, it has to sort of feel magic when you first re read it you think why didn't i think about that that and you have to find holes as well well in it but one of the things that was that i found over my career is Frequently, new PhD students don't want to read any papers outside of their research areas because they think this is going to take from my time, whereas it actually is something that gives you different different ideas and different ways of, of, of see, seeing things. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Sam? I, well, I, I think I basically want to echo what the other two have said, but... Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think you can't really sort of go looking for a project and say, oh, what, what should I work on next? And it doesn't work that way. Um, if, if you're engaged in research, then you just bump into things and you get excited by them. And it's the things that you're excited by that you should work on. If, 
if you you read if you just see oh this is really popular everyone's doing whatever blockchain machine learning you shouldn't just do that because there's lots of money in it, in it and everyone else is doing it you need that excitement and simply being a researcher means that you'll be solving one problem and you'll run into other ones and and then if you particularly if you engage outside of your area as as Sophia was saying as Susan was saying um, then um, you'll often speak to people and and you'll you'll make some sort of connection and go oh right could I apply my idea to to this other uh, th this other area and that that can be really rewarding um, so you don't I don't think it's really something you can particularly plan for it just kind of if you're if you're engaged in the system and talking to people then then you'll you'll um, come across ideas and if you don't then maybe you shouldn't be a researcher do something else instead right. uh let me see so uh sophia uh, has, has a question i think or should we finish the first round first i'd like to qualify what sam said because i think it's uh, it might sound terrifying i think sam what you are describing is your state of, of things not uh, uh uh, somebody who is uh, at the end of their undergraduate or starting their PhD. When you start your PhD, you, it's so, I think it's so big. There are all these tools, all the things to, to consider. It, and you don't know what has been done. So this is something, a blissful state of uh, affairs that uh, uh, you are, uh, uh, you will probably reach, but you're not expected some of the young people here are not expected to have now. Do you agree, Absolutely. Sam? Absolutely, and no one starts off that way. But but when you're starting off, just just learn things, go to talks, read read papers, uh, engage with it. And it doesn't matter actually. You don't have to. I mean, if you're starting your PhD, you don't actually have to. You, it's worth having an idea what your your the subject of your PhD is when you start off. But you can change. And do if 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 you find that the thing you're not you're working on isn't the thing that excites you and something else does. I mean, okay, you have to limit that as well. But but no, I absolutely agree. I didn't mean to say that <laughs> or to scare people. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a tough question, uh, Ji Hoon. Okay, so it so in undergraduate under study you might have learned a lot of things from school basically a lot of things about systems from languages and etc and the reason why i i started my my career as a program language researcher in 2013 is because the peer course course was the most interesting to me so so at, at an early stage of career i think that kind of thing is really important something that is it is interesting to you so at the beginning of my career i started studying homotopic type theory, uh, which is uh, vastly different from what I'm doing right now because it was fun at the time. But but one layer after my my advisor told me that I cannot fund you if you <laughs> continue to do that because, because he was not interested in the topic. So I changed to other things to, for example, C program languages, the semantics of C program languages, etc. And the kind of funding things also also affect what you're doing and i think that it is not that not that bad because the funding is basically simply it it means the interest of the others basically so the money proves that it is interesting to at least some of the people out there so in that way it can be a good research topic and yeah by doing so so i changed my topic to C program languages and then to concurrency because in the in the semantics of C program language the concurrency is the most complicated and not yet resolved topic in that area and then I move on to some parallel systems because concurrency and parallelism are closely related and move on to FPGAs and operating systems and so on so so I'm wandering around the topics and that is basically that is a fundamental nature of researcher I think. But at the beginning of the career, I think it is important to start with something you are interested in. That way you can make more progress to than the other topics. Great. 
thank you, Jihoon. Uh, Delphine? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I agree with, uh, with everything that was said. Uh, I, I think that uh, at, at when, you, when you start to, to, to do research, so meaning that you start your PhD, uh, probably you need, to, you need to pick a subject uh, that, that, uh, that you think that you are interested in. Uh, and then and then go and 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 dig uh, very very deep in, into that subject, uh, and also uh, I think that it is very important to discuss with people and to exchange with your colleagues, with your PhD students, uh, uh, comrades, and uh, and also uh, uh, go to conferences and uh, try to to speak uh, of your subject with. Uh, with people that uh, that you don't know, <laughs> uh, by explaining things to to people that you don't know, uh, sometimes you have the the very uh, uh, good surprise to to find some uh, some matches uh, and and to slightly derive uh, uh, some uh, some ideas and some new ideas for the future, and then from from uh, 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 from close to close discussion, you will you will you will find your way uh, uh, into that that uh, that very uh, uh, wide landscape. I think. Great, thanks, Delphine. Uh, Pavonia. Oh uh, wow! So I've been trying to think about something that people haven't talked about. Um, so maybe the first thing I want to say is that I wasn't start my PhD in the PL at all. I was actually doing algorithms. And then later on, I changed my area completely and also my advisor. Okay, so, uh, so yes, it's very common to change your topic. But the important thing I think is that you have to dive very deeply in the beginning of the PhD. Um, well, sorry, excuse me. Uh, in the kind of maybe after a few years at least, in the beginning, maybe you want to like, explore a little more to find out your interest. But once you find something that really interests you, uh, you really have to deep, uh, dive very deep uh, to get a sense of what's going on. And the reason is that you are not getting the ideas out of blue. That's not how our brains work. Whenever you feel that you have ideas coming out of nowhere, that, wow, I just got an idea. There's actually lots of work going under your conscious. It's actually the, the some idea emerge as a solution because your brain has been working secretly behind you that uh, to construct a possible solution. So that means that you actually have to think about this very deeply. And one day, one day that your subconscious feel that the solution is ready, then that will emerge to your conscious mind. So it's your idea, but it's not really your idea. So you need to give your brain enough time and energy to do this. And that's why Thinking deep is helpful in that sense. Okay, let me stop here. Uh, thanks, Savonia. Um, okay, so we're kind of running out of time for the panel, uh, but I just kind of wanted to leave one more question. Um, so uh, the next question we had is, again, something that happens quite, quite often in research is that we try to do something, but uh, kind of uh, we hit some step setback or obstacle or some paper rejection or something like this. Uh, so I was wondering if you could tell me about, you know, maybe a paper rejection that led to a significantly improved paper or some other obstacle that, uh, you know, and maybe in retrospect, uh, led you on some, some better path. So, um, I had a, not, not a paper, but a proposal that I wrote to the NSF that, um, it, it was with Andrew Appel, and it, it turned in, and Delphine was involved with this, I think. Uh, this is the Certicoc, turned, turned into the Certicoc project. But uh, the first time through, we didn't write it well. Uh, the, the second time, um, and part of that was it was all last minute. The second time, the government shut down. And so we got an extra month to work on the proposal. And, um, you know, but but I thought we had to deliver it. So so actually, the lesson I learned from that was, wow, if you can set yourself a deadline a month early, and live by it, then you can spend that time polishing 
that the you know the proposal or the paper or whatever, and it really makes a big difference. Um, I mean, I was very happy with that. I think the other lesson I learned was no proposal ever gets thrown away. That you you just change it, you you take the feedback from the reviewers, and and eventually um, you know it, it morphs into something that that is good. You know, if it's coming from the right place. So, um, and that's probably true for papers as well. Great, thanks, Greg. Uh, Susan? So I think I'm not very good at this because I am interested in too many things. So my career is littered with things where if I had continued on something, I would have been more, su more successful, but instead, something I liked wasn't appreciated. So I thought, okay, I'll, I have too many other thing, things uh, to do. I mean, certainly I had papers that were improved by rejections. And it took me a little while to realize that when the reviewers didn't understand what I said, it was entirely my fault, not them being idiots. And it was, it was completely obvious. So I take, misunderstanding of reviewers as as something that's that's not in the paper that should be that that's not not that my motivation isn't strong enough but my entire career is filled with things i i didn't i didn't follow through so i'm not i'm not the right person i'm not the right person to ask on on this one all right uh thanks susan uh sam uh, yeah, I think I'm, all submissions, whether they're um, grant proposals or papers or whatever, I think they can always be improved. And uh, usually, even if some of the reviews seem unreasonable, uh, usually you have some uh, useful insight you can gain from them, which you can then use to improve the paper. Or, as is normally the case, you've left things to the last minute. It just gives you another chance to polish the thing. Um, so yeah, I think most of my papers that have been rejected have been improved significantly by um, rewriting, although not, I wouldn't say always monotonically. So sometimes you have sort of, you make, you, you, you hit dead ends. Uh, I have a couple of interesting examples, I suppose. Um, one is well, both were papers that were rejected about five times before being accepted. Uh, and I think both suffered from a sim similar problem, which was straddling kind of two areas. So one of them was um, between databases and PL. Uh, and we kind of tried submitting it to the PL conferences, tried submitting it to database conferences, and it seemed like neither side understood one another. Uh, I'd say there was, so it was me, James Cheney, and Phil Wadler were the authors. And Phil and I kind of gave up because there were issues with the paper anyway. But James persisted and listened to what the reviewer said. And I think he actually ended up with a, well, a much better paper than the thing we started off with. And it was published at Sigmod, which was pretty good. Uh, there was another one where I wasn't actually involved in the original paper. It was a I was collaborating with some systems people and they were struggling to explain their functional programming stuff to systems people. They didn't understand what this funny composition operator thing was, what's this circle. Um, it got rejected, I think about five times and then they brought me in and I helped them try to target it at ICFP and it got accepted. Um, so I'm not quite sure, I'm, I'm waffling a bit here. I'm not quite sure what my main method, message is, but I guess it's, um, things can take time. And even if it feels like people are, the world's against you, that there are normally um, pearls of wisdom in, in, in the feedback you get from people. So it, it can be yeah. worth persisting. Okay, cool. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Jihoon? So, in, when I was in graduate school, my advisor and my mentors, for example, Dick Dreyer, who, who, with whom I worked with very closely. So working with them, almost always, paper got just accepted without any rejections. <laughs> so I thought that it was a usual procedure. <laughs> I thought it was a, how papers were written. 
and then I graduated and started my own career as an independent researcher. And now I realize that <laughs> accepting a paper is a great deal of work. And actually, my advisors and my, my mentors, they didn't write papers in, in months. They are writing papers in 10 years or 10 years, and they have some experience in writing things, and they know how to get papers accepted. And as, as an early career as a faculty, I am now learning how to write papers independently from me with my students. And, and as a first such a paper, I, I submitted a paper on garbage collection algorithm and it got rejected multiple times. And that was the, the reason was that it is not written in a specific way uh, that people can understand. For example, you need to first let people understand the, the, the problem, and then you then you need to explain your solution, etc. But but I didn't write the papers in that way. So in a sense, so so reviewers cannot understand what I told. So that's the that's the reason why they just said they don't understand or things must be written differently. And that the kind of the kind of reviews really help me a lot as a, as a, as a early career faculty and now I, i'm also improving my writing skills i can realize that i can write much much better 10 times better than two years before and uh, when i started my career so i think that in the future i i think the same thing will happen as well i will get a lot of papers rejected and doing so the community is helping me to raise my writing skills. And it is a, also a mutual, mutual process. I also need to reject papers of the others and so that I can help the others to improve their skills. And, and I think that's how this peer review is expected to work. Great, uh, thanks Jihoon. Uh, Delphine? Yes. Um... Maybe I so so of course uh, <laughs> I have plenty of such examples. Uh, every time a paper gets uh, rejected, it you can improve on it uh, based on the the feedback from the reviewers, uh, also from uh, getting some feedback from your colleagues, uh, and also from uh, from people that are not that are colleagues of yours, but not not uh, working in the precise area of the paper. Uh, and, um, but I, I, I just wanted to say that sometimes you are happy that a paper doesn't get accepted uh, because, uh, 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 because sometimes the reviewers are right, uh, the paper is not ready, and uh, you, you finally, after the, after the, the rejection uh, notification, you are most... Uh, 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 thankful for them for not uh, having accepted this paper because uh, this is a great opportunity for you to rework on the on the on the submission and to improve the quality of the technical work behind it and uh, uh, it happened to me once uh, especially where the paper was not ready because the story behind the paper was not clear uh, we we hadn't uh, uh, we hadn't a, a clear view of what the contribution uh, was and sometimes it can be very hard to describe uh, and to isolate clearly what what is the contribution and what what problem it does solve uh, etc and so uh, we got rejected uh, we we work on the on the paper and on the on the technical meat of the paper uh, for about a year and then the paper got uh, accepted but it was not the same paper uh, we did uh, fully we work our approach and uh, in the end i'm i'm very happy that the paper did it, didn't uh, uh, go through uh, at the first time cool uh, thanks delphine and uh, favonia hi uh, so i feel that i was very lucky i i think i have some wonderful co-authors like help our paper to get accepted so, uh, so maybe what I can share is that uh, 
uh, many of people I know, including my friend, including myself, uh, have some emotional reaction to the rejections. And I think maybe I can provide some, some comments on that. So, um, so I think one way to overcome the emotional reaction so that you can really take in what we will say, which are usually very helpful, uh, is to know what are uh, at stack. What I mean is that maybe, for example, you think that uh, you are a good person because you are smart and maybe the criticism from the review will think that you are not smart or maybe you put lots of work, lots of time in your work and the criticism make, make you feel that the time you're putting are not worth it. So um, I'm not saying that it's very easy to over, overcome this, but knowing what you, how you value yourself so that you know what kind of things can trigger you could help you overcome the emotional reaction you might have when you're seeing the criticism from the reviewers. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thanks, Vonia. Uh, unfortunately, we're kind of already running a bit over time. Uh, so I would just uh, once again thank all of the panelists uh, for also staying a bit over. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, if any of you are able to kind of hang out uh, in this room afterwards, um, you know, students may have more questions. Uh, but in any, any case, uh, let's let's kind of give a round of applause to all the panelists um, who kind of gave us their in, insight and interesting answers to these questions. Thanks a lot. Could I also just say a special thanks to Ji-Hun Kang, who agreed to be on the panel despite the unaccommodating time zone, because it is 5 a.m. now in Korea. And thank you so much, yeah. Ji-Hun. Thank you so much, Ji-Hun. Thank you thank for you. inviting me. Thank you, Justin. And Zelia, everybody who organized, appreciate it. Stephanie.